All right, uh, YouTube viewers, this is going to be an interesting um, experiment. My guest today is Dr. Abhimanyu Tushir. He just, um, uh, he's a, um, a pathology applicant from Canada who's finished medical school and is uh, hoping to join pathology at some point. And we are, I just um, impromptu started this talk today and uh, just put a message out on Twitter saying who would join and he volunteered. So thank you Abhimanyu for doing this. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay. Um, sure. So we are going to talk about immunohistochemistry. Okay, Abhimanyu. So if you ever start pathology, this will be super helpful for you in terms right. of, uh, you know, what to expect. So here, let me give you a little introduction to immunohistochemistry. Okay. So on this panel, this thing here is the, can you see my, my arrow moving around? Yes, I can. So this thing that I made here is a, a cell, obviously. And this thing is the nucleus. The gray thing is the cytoplasm. Make sense? Right. So on the next panel, what I've shown you is an antigen on the cell and an antibody in green. So the, obviously the antibody is attaching to the antigen. Mm -hmm. So in immunohistochemistry, what happens is you are trying to find a particular antigen. That's really the goal of immunohistochemistry. And for that, you have to have an antibody that goes and attaches to that antigen. So the antibody is something you have to buy from a commercial vendor or you have to you know, make your own in your lab or whatever, but eventually you have to have an antibody to make immunohistochemistry work. And so what happens is the antibody attaches to the antigen of interest, and then you use the second antibody to attach to that antibody. Right. 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 So that's the orange thing there. So that's the secondary antibody. And then how do you see it? Because you can't really see an antibody under a microscope, right? So you need a chromogen, something to make it get a color. Hmm. And that is the brown thing on top. So the chromogen attaches to the secondary antibody. So it's a whole link cell, antigen, antibody, another antibody, and something that makes it brown. Kind of like Lego blocks. Right, like Lego blocks, exactly. <laughs> so does that make sense, Abhimanyu, for how that works? Yes, yes, absolutely. So at the end of the day, what you get is you get a brown color on where the antigen is, is located in the cell. Isn't that a cool thing? I mean, the idea is pretty cool, isn't it? Yep, yep, most amazing. So you say, I want to look at this antigen, you make an antibody against that and you turn everywhere that that, that antigen is turns brown with immunohistochemistry. I'm saying brown, but sometimes you can change the chromogen to be red. And so you can get red, you know, you can have a red chromogen and everything with a particular antibody will turn red. Make sense? Right, yep. Yeah, so whatever is positive turns brown, whatever is negative stays unstained. So it stains with the color that your counter stain had, which is, let's say you counter stain everything blue, everything else stays blue and only the thing with the antigen turns brown, right? Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go to the next part of this. So let us assume your antigen of interest is CD20. Now CD20 is an antigen that's found on B lymphocytes mm -hmm. and that's found on the membrane of the cell. It's sitting on the membrane. So the antibody attaches to the CD20, the secondary antibody attaches to that, the chromogen attaches to that, and then the entire membrane turns brown. So that's how it works the entire membrane turns brown. And so you'll see when you do immunohistochemistry for CD20, the, surf, the membrane of the cells with CD20 turns brown. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yep. All right, so that's one example. Let's take another example. Let's say the antigen of interest is not on the membrane, it's in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. A typical example of that would be thyroid transcription factor, TTF1. Right. So the same sequence of events happens, except the thing that turns brown is the nucleus now. Mm -hmm. There's no brown on the membrane, no brown in the cytoplasm. Only the nucleus will turn brown because only the nucleus has TTF1 in it. Got Make it. sense? Yep. So we call things like these nuclear markers, things that where the antigen is only in the nucleus, so this, the antibody only marks the nucleus. And so the color only shows up in the nucleus. Similarly, we have things like HMB45, which is a marker of melanomas, mm -hmm. where the antigen is in the cytoplasm. So only the cytoplasm turns brown. So you have membrane antigens, you have cytoplasmic antigens, and you have nuclear antigens, yeah. right? Okay. Pretty straightforward? Yep. Now let's, so how I divided this talk, Abhimanyu, is by um, what it's staining. So can you tell whether it's nucleus, cytoplasm, or membrane in this particular case? Yeah, it seems to be nuclear. Nuclear, staining. correct. So this is a nuclear stain, which means that the antigen that we're looking for is only in the nucleus. And the classic one there is thyroid transcription factor. I love that because I'm a lung pathologist, you know, 
So I use it a lot in my practice. So the thyroid transcription factor stains all those things that have TTF1 in their nucleus. So that's alveolar pneumocytes, normal cells of the alveolus, bronchiolar lining cells, lung adenocarcinomas, because they arise from that, small cell carcinomas of the lung. There's an um, unusual tumor called sclerosing pneumocytoma, and also thyroid carcinomas, as you might guess from the name, thyroid transcription factor. Right. Actually, it's, it's more difficult to guess from the name that it stains lung than that it stains thyroid. You would think it would stain thyroid, right? True. So in this particular example, the tumor I've stained here is sclerosing pneumocytoma. And in sclerosing pneumocytoma, the tumor cells are positive for TTF1. Mm -hmm. Got yeah, that, everyone? Does also, that make sense? Oh, yes. I think you also made a video on sclerosing. He, yes, I That's made true. a video on sclerosing pneumocytoma because Matt Cicchini and myself mm -hmm. um, have explained that in our book in two different chapters, in the biopsy chapter and in the dissection chapter. So right. that's a, a tumor that you can get tripped up by in lung pathology. All right, so let's go to another very common nuclear marker in lung pathology that is called P63. Mm -hmm. And that's a marker also nuclear of normal basal and myoepithelial cells. And it also stains squamous cell carcinomas of, of everywhere. No matter where the squamous cell carcinoma arises, it stains for P63. So lung or oropharynx, you know, wherever, oral skin, all are P63 positive. And another unusual tumor that stains for P63 is the, is the so-called nut carcinoma, mm -hmm. which is a very trendy thing nowadays. So in this particular case, this is a nut carcinoma and you can see strong P63 straining in all the nuclei, right? Abhimanyu, you pretty clear, right? Right, and I think the difference between P40 and P63 is this nut carcinoma. Yes, yes, you're very much ahead of the game. The, so that does happen in a subset of cases, although not all. Not all cases have this unique uh, difference, but you're right to point out that there are some cases of nut carcinoma where the P63 is positive, but the P40 is negative, and that can be a clue to the diagnosis. But that doesn't always happen. So sometimes both markers are positive. Sometimes both can be negative. So nut car carcinoma can be very, very uh, tricky, you know, in terms of immunohistochemistry because there's so many different profiles. Okay. okay, let's go to P40. Now P40 is also a squamous marker, just like P63. And the difference is, although it also is super sensitive, just like P63, it is more specific, meaning that it doesn't stain other things other than P63. So it stains exactly the same things that P63 does. There are a few exceptions and knowing those exceptions is helpful. But the important thing for this lecture is for basic immunology chemistry, nuclear marker, right? It is a nuclear marker, just like P63. Right, right. everyone, you make sense? Yes, absolutely. So if you're using a marker for squamous cell carcinoma, you could use either P63 or P40. Mm -hmm. And although P40 is slightly better, you they are roughly equivalent. All right, let's go to another one that is a very trendy marker nowadays. That's called right. INSM1 or insulinoma associated protein one. Yeah, you I think can see up uh... there in the red mm -hmm. that I've highlighted all the things that make up the abbreviation, INSM and then one. Oh, yes. Right, that's how you get the name. Mm -hmm. And it's called insulinoma associated because it was first discovered in insulinomas. Oh, okay. And then subsequently we found out that it stains all neuroendocrine things everywhere. Right. So insulinoma like associated protein is almost the same as using synaptophysin or chromogranin. The, the main difference is that this is a nuclear marker and those are not. So okay. this is the only nuclear marker of neuroendocrine differentiation. Among I think this is... Them. Well, the second generation of neuroendocrine markers? Correct, so. correct. The first generation being all the other ones that we know, synaptophysin, chromogranin, CD56, you know. And if you really want to use a bad marker, you can also use NSE, okay. which is a neuron-specific enolase, which also called non-specific <laughs> non <-specific laughs> enolase. Okay. It just, it's, it's really, in the current day and age, you shouldn't be using NSE for anything. Mm -hmm. um, and um, adding INSM1 to your, you know, armamentarium of immunohistochemical stains is great because it's it's very specific, just like chromogranate. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move to another nuclear marker, nuclear protein in testis or mm -hmm. nut, which we just talked about. So that's why you get the name nut. It comes from nuclear protein in testis. And as you might expect, it stains germ cells in the testis, normal germ cells. Right. In this particular photo, it stains nut carcinoma, which you know is a you know very aggressive carcinoma in the in the thorax and other other sites. So it's a nuclear marker. This particular clone C52B1 is very very specific for nut carcinoma. So it's very helpful if you have it in your lab 
Unfortunately, not very many labs have it so far, but I'm, I'm anticipating as this becomes more of a well-known entity, people will, will start buying the antibody and get it in their lab too. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to Epstein-Barr virus encoded RNA. So E-B-E-R, Eber. Mm -hmm. So Eber is a stain for Epstein-Barr virus. That's what we use in our lab. And it's not an immunohistochemistry. So Abhimanyu, do you, have you heard this term SISH ever? C-I-S-H, SISH? Well, I heard SISH and FISH. Yes. But I'm not very clear. Should I explain to you the difference? Yes, please. please yeah. Do. So, you know, in immunohistochemistry, you're looking for antigens, right? So all antigens are proteins. Mm -hmm. In immuno, um, in, in situ hybridization, your tag is attaching not to the protein, but to the RNA. Okay. So it goes straight to the genetic material, not to the protein. Right, got it. So your tag attaches there, and there's two ways to see that tag once it's attached. One is you use the chromogen, just like you would do in immunohistochemistry. Mm -hmm. So if you use a chromogen, it's called chromogenic. So SISH. Okay. C-I-S-H, SISH, like in this picture. The chromogen is blue, so everything that turned blue is positive for Epstein-Barr virus. Okay. Now, what if you don't use a, a chromogen? Instead, you use a fluorescent signal. Okay, got it. Then we get the fish. Then we get fish. Right? right, And the disadvantage with that is that you to look at a fluorescent signal, you need a fluorescent microscope, right. which none of us have. <laughs> you might have one fluorescent microscope in your lab, but everybody else is using a standard microscope, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So SISH is very easily readable by all every pathologist with a microscope. For fish, you need a special microscope. And so it becomes a very specialized technique. Right. Make right. sense? Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right, so this is Epstein-Barr virus, and of course, EBV is positive in any cell that's infected with EBV and in tumors where that are driven by EBV. The common one, you know, Burkitt lymphoma is the famous one, but, you know, diffuse large B-cell lymphomas or lymphomatoid granulomatosis in the lung. There are many, many things that are EBV positive. All of them will stain with Epstein-Barr virus encoded RNA, or which is also called EBER. Make sense? Yep. Another yes. example of a nuclear marker. And the reason it stains the nucleus is that the virus is in the nucleus, right? It's in there. Right. right. All right. So let's go now to the PAX-8, another one of my favorite markers. And the why it's a favorite of mine is because it never stains lung cancer, lung adenocarcinomas especially. It never shows strong and diffuse nuclear positivity in lung adenocarcinomas. So when I see this, I know this is not lung. It's something else. Uh, and this name comes from paired box gene eight. Everyone, you do you know what box means? Do you know where that comes from? It's an interesting story. No, but I would love to. Hear. Yeah, there are these things called homeobox. There's right. a thing called a homeobox that right. is important in the growth and development of Drosophila, which is like a some sort of a insect or bug or whatever that's used in in. So biologists have been using Drosophila for decades to figure out how development occurs. You know, right. they knock out a gene and the antenna doesn't form. They knock out another gene and limb doesn't form. So right. from studies on Drosophila, they have found out a lot about how development occurs. Okay. And how it occurs is by these genes that uh, are called, that uh, control the homeoboxes. They're called mm -hmm. homeobox genes. So th there's a certain um, genes that control limb development, certain genes that control branching morphogenesis in the respiratory tract. So all these genes have some kind of an X name in them. So PAX8, you know, or HOX okay. or SOX. So they all come from these development derived names. Oh, uh, yeah, I know SOX. Yes, oh, like SOX10 or PAX8 or PAX2, PAX5. That's where that thing is from. So PAX8 is a, is a homeobox derived gene. And PAX8 stains B lymphocytes as well as carcinomas of the thyroid, kidney, and GYN tract. What it does not stain is carcinomas of the lung, especially adenocarcinoma. So very helpful in your, when you're trying to tell site of origin, right? Right. In this right. particular case, it is staining a thyroid carcinoma, which is papillary thyroid. Again, this is a nuclear marker, very important. If it stains hmm. the cytoplasm or membrane, that's not valid because that's just background staining. Okay. It must stain the nucleus to be considered positive. All right, let's go to, exclusively. Mm -hmm. yeah, exclusively. Mm -hmm. Same thing with GATA3, which is another nuclear marker. Nuclear, it binds the DNA sequence called GATA. You know how you have DNA sequences like that? 
Right, right. So GATA3 gets its name because it binds the DNA sequence GATA. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I actually, I think one of the coolest things about this presentation is going to be finding out how the names were derived for, of these things. Absolutely, you know? I can see that. <laughs> it's going to be cool. So here's GATA3 and it's most common, famous uses are for detect, for that it stains breast carcinoma and urothelial carcinoma. That's what it's famous for. But it right. also stains T lymphocytes. It also stains some mesotheliomas and lung cancers. So a lot of people have noticed that it stains so many things that it seems to be useless, but that's not true. You know, in certain differentials, it can be very helpful. So if you're using it in lung adeno versus breast, it can be very helpful. You know, if you're, so you, it really has to be tailored to some specific situations and then it can be very helpful. In fact, GATA3 has replaced other breast markers as the most sensitive marker for breast carcinoma by oh. far. So I don't even use memoglobin or GCDFP most of the time. When I'm trying to tell lung from breast, I mm -hmm. just use GATA3 and TTF1 and, I, and, and I'm done for that. Right. So remember I can see there must be a lot of overlap between breast yes. and lung. Yes, there is overlap. So in fact, you can have, for example, you can have breast carcinomas that are positive for GATA3, rarely, uh, for, for TTF1, I mean, rarely. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have lung adenocarcinomas that are positive for GATA3. So it is by no means a perfect antibody, but there's almost no antibodies are perfect. Even TTF is not a perfect antibody. The closest I can get to a perfect antibody is um, uh, the thing for the solitary fibrous tumor. It's uh, escaping my mind, right? STAT6. STAT6. Yeah, okay. that's the closest I can get to a almost perfect immunohistochemical marker that uh, stains all examples of what it should stain and does not stain what it should not stain. The rest are, are not perfect. All right, so continuing on a theme of nuclear markers, the next one is ERG. And the reason it gets its name is it's, it's called the ETS-related gene, ERG, ERG. And this is a marker of endothelial cells. So Abhimanyu, can you tell what the, can you see what this structure is that I'm pointing at? Yeah, it seems to be a vessel. Could yes. Be artery or a vein. Very good. Yeah. It's a small blood vessel, mm -hmm. kind of a capillary size vessel almost. It's very small. And you mm -hmm. can see these cells that are lining it are positive, right? Right. So these are endothelial cells. So GAT, uh, ERG has become a really, really good marker of vascular things, much better than what we had before, which was CD34 and CD31. So it is also a nuclear marker. Okay, makes sense? Mm -hmm. ERG. And then this, so you can have a nuclear marker for a uh, virus just, with, just as we did for Epstein-Barr virus, right? This right. one is cytomegalovirus. So you have immun immunohistochemical stain that will stain the nucleus that's infected with cytomegalovirus. In fact, it also shows small cytoplasmic dots where the cytoplasm, uh, because uh, CMV is both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. But in this particular picture, you can't really see good cytoplasmic dots. There might be some there, but not great. Maybe at the top left, right below like the here? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Further up? Yeah, or that one, that one, maybe yes, not. Yes, that one. Yeah, I think mostly what we're seeing is nuclear positivity in these okay. cells. But it's okay. a really, really good immunohistochemical marker for cytomegalovirus. Again, nuclear marker, okay? So we've seen two viruses already that you can stain with immunohistochemistry, EBV right. and CMV. All right, let's go to estrogen receptors. So in breast cancers, endometrial cancers, estrogen receptors are in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. So ER stains uh, is a nuclear marker. It stains all um, things that normally express estrogen receptors, which is normal breast, normal endometrium, cancers of the breast and endometrium, and other, you know, stromal sarcomas and things that can arise from these sites. Also very logical, right? Right. Right. Okay. Then we'll move to a very interesting name, which I, uh, we've started using this marker called NKX 3.1, which is a prostate marker. Right. Um, more sensitive than PSA, prostate specific antigen, mm -hmm. or PSMA and all that. So NKX 3.1 seems like a very uh, weird name to give a stain, but it actually comes from two people called Nirenberg and Kim, who were the people who are actually Nobel Prize winners who oh. were involved in the discovery of this. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's how it comes. So N is Nirenberg, K is Kim. And X is because it's a homeobox gene, just like Pax8. Right, right. So involved in development. So NKX 3.1 is a great marker for prostate adenocarcinomas. Very, very sensitive. Uh, 
there is a caveat that it needs to be strongly and diffusely positive. So just one or, one or two cells weakly staining here and there doesn't make it. But if you keep that caveat in mind, it's a great, great marker for prostate adenocarcinomas. And in some institutions, uh, I think is uh, becoming a really good adjunct to PSA. And many people realize that it's much more sensitive than PSA for prostate cancer. Okay. And uh, Dr. Sanjay, when you say, um, like how much is it staining? So is that an objective thing or just subjective? Dependent subjective. On subjective. Okay. You know, when, when you're talking about strong and diffuse, you're saying basically every cell in that tumor is positive. Okay. And strong meaning that the brown is really a dark, deep brown, you know? Right, right. When you say focal and weak, what you're saying is that most of the cells are not staining. And mm -hmm. there's an occasional cell that turns brown, a little bit brown here, a little bit there, and it's light brown. So okay. you're almost thinking in your mind, is this even really positive or not? Right, right. You know, that's the kind of staining that you should ignore if it's NKX 3.1. I think I had one discussion around um, HER2 being equivocal and how that's being sent for. So it was sent for fish testing, and yes. I think that's how they decide. Yes, and in a stain that, it, that de determines therapy, like HER2 or PDL1, that okay. issue becomes very, very important, right? It becomes super important, whether it's staining 10% cells or 20% or 100, or whether it's weakly positive or strongly positive, depending. So it depends really on the marker, how, how careful you need to be about those things. You know, right. there are some markers like TTF1, even if they're focally positive, it means something. Okay. You know, so you really have to know the specifics of that particular marker and how to interpret that. It right. makes, but that's a great question, everybody. All right, let's go to the next marker, which is uh, SF1, steroidogenic factor one. This is a marker of adrenocortical things like adrenocortical carcinomas, also mm -hmm. sex cord stromal tumors. And what we use it for is um, uh, the diagnosis of adrenocortical carcinoma. So a great nuclear marker that stains those tumor cells. All right, and this is my favorite stain of all time, STAT6. Yeah, we just spoke about it. Yes, the, num the name comes from signal transducer and activator of transcription, STAT6. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great marker for solitary fibrous tumor. In the past, we used to use BCL2 and CD34. That's almost become obsolete now that we have this marker. Another marker, which is, uh, some people like it, some don't, is TLE1, transducin-like enhancer of split one, TLE. And why some people like it and some don't is that we don't really have a great, until recently, we didn't have a great marker for synovial sarcoma, an immunostochemical marker. And people used to use TLE1 as sort of a screen to pick up those tumors, but it's neither highly sensitive nor highly specific. So people just gave up on that. And some people said, well, we'll just, whenever we suspect this, we'll go straight to fish and, and just bypass this suboptimal marker. But some people still like it. Mm -hmm. um, as a marker of synovial sarcomas. It is not perfect by any means. So there are many, many pitfalls to this marker. Also Maybe a nuclear some... marker, that's why I included it here. Right. Maybe in yeah. some resource constrained setting, you may have to use this. Correct. Where... Exactly. If you don't have fish in your lab, for example, you might have to use it. Here's another great marker is lymphoid enhancer binding factor one or LEF1. And this has become a new marker for CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. When I was a resident, we didn't have that in our lab. We, that it, it hadn't even come out then. So it, it only appeared when I was already in practice and in my second job. So oh, wow. it's a very new stain, left one for CLL, nuclear marker. And then K67, sorry, I didn't put a picture here, but everybody knows what that looks like. It's just a proliferation marker that stains the nuclei. It stains right. proliferating cells in any active phase of the cell cycle. Right. So, um, you know, we'll stain the nucleus always. KI-67 comes from Kiel-67, K-I-E-L-67. That's another yeah, so, nice way, nice thing to remember in terms of where- Yeah, there was uh, some discussion on how to pronounce it. Yes, I don't know. Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> who knows how it's pronounced? We'll have to ask somebody who comes from Kiel. It might be actually, I, I think it's a city, but I, again, I could be wrong about that too. Mm -hmm. Maybe Abhinaman, uh, you can find out, Abhinaman, you do some research on what Kiel is and post it on Twitter. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's move to the next nuclear marker, terminal deoxynucleotidyl transferase or TDT. Mm -hmm. Superb marker for thymic lymphocytes. Okay. Great marker. So it's always present in the normal thymus because they have lymphocytes that are TDT positive. 
And it is also present in thymomas. Many thymomas or most thymomas have some amount of TDT positive lymphocytes. Um, unfortunately, it's also positive in one other tumor that's in the differential and that's lymphoblastic lymphoma. That, can, that is also TDT positive. So you, you really have to use morphology plus TDT to mm -hmm. figure out whether it's a lymphoblastic lymphoma or a thymoma. But if your differential is, let's say, some other kind of carcinoma versus thymoma, this is super, super helpful. If you right. have any TDT positive lymphocytes in it, that's a very uh, strong sign that you're dealing with a thymoma in, in an epithelial tumor. So TDT, and is positive in the lymphocytes, not in the epithelial cells. All right, and then we have a, a fancy marker called integrase in interactor one, INI1. INI1 is lost in some, some uh, a subset of tumors, uh, which are called INI deficient neoplasms, like epithelioid sarcoma, for example. But otherwise, INI1 is expressed in all cells, all cells. Mm -hmm. So like here, there's a, there's a lung here and the bronchial cells are expressing it, the capillaries are expressing it, the epithelial right. cells are expressing it. It's almost like a marker of, uh, you can use to show that your immunohistochemistry is working, you know, because it, it stains everything. It should stain everything. So the only thing it doesn't stain is the INI deficient neoplasms. Okay. So that's, how, that's how it's helpful. It's a nuclear marker. Okay. And then let's go to some nuclear markers that are used in lymphoma, BCL6 which mm -hmm. comes from B cell lymphoma, 6 BCL, is a marker that's positive in normal germinal centers and in um, B cell lymphomas that are of germinal center origin. And then you have, uh, I think we are, I think that's the last one I have for nuclear markers. So Abhimanyu, this is, I've given you a sampling of thank nuclear you. markers that are used in immunohistochemistry. Okay. Yeah, thank you so very much, Dr. Sanjay. It's yes, should we move helpful. to something else? So we'll move to cytoplasmic? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, so the first one we'll do there is napsin A. This is a lung marker also. Novel aspartic proteinase of the pepsin family. That's how the name comes. Okay. Napsin. Okay. First uh, discovered by the Japanese uh, uh, scientific community and then later on came to the US around 20, uh, 2010 and became known, well known as a marker of lung adenocarcinomas. So it stains alveolar pneumocytes, lung adenocarcinomas and also macrophages in the uh, air spaces. So it's a little bit more dirty stain than TTF1, which only stains the pneumocytes, doesn't stain macrophages. And uh, you can see the difference here between napsin and TTF1 is that napsin is a cytoplasmic marker. You see? Right, right. See the difference? Yeah. In fact, for all cytoplasmic markers, the nucleus will be left unstained. So there's a little blue dot in the middle of the cell, you know, like an mm. unstained part. Mm -hmm. which isn't mm -hmm. staining, which is how, uh, so napsin should always stain the cytoplasm in a granular fashion and is one example of a cytoplasmic marker. Let's go to another cytoplasmic marker, synaptophysin. Right. And that's a neuroendocrine marker, our standard neuroendocrine marker. Here mm -hmm. it's staining pancreatic islet cells. Synaptophysin is one of the most sensitive neuroendocrine markers, although not very specific. Mm -hmm. Then chromogranin. So chromogranin is the reverse of synaptophysin. It's not very sensitive, but it is very specific. What that means is when chromogranin is positive, you can be almost sure that a tumor is really neuroendocrine. So you can trust it. Right. However, it will not stain all of the neuroendocrine tumors. So it's not very sensitive. Got that Abhimanyu, the difference between the sensitive right. and specific. Right. So in right. this example, it is staining a small cell carcinoma, which is a neuroendocrine carcinoma of the lung. Here is uh, my favorite pan-keratin stain, which is a cocktail called keratin AE1 slash A3. Nowadays, it's become fashionable to say, instead of cytokeratin, you say keratin nowadays. That's the, the fashion. Right, that confused me in the starting. <laughs> yes, in, in my days, we used to say CK7, CK20. Now we say keratin 7, keratin 20. So keratin AE1, A3 is a great pan-keratin marker, stains everything that is epithelial normal epithelial cells, carcinomas, mesotheliomas, anything of epithelial origin will be positive. A great pan-keratin stain to have and to use in your differential. What, so in your you know, broad spectrum differential of is this carcinoma or lymphoma, this is the stain to use first. Okay. Great stain to have. And then a similar stain, I don't have a picture here, sorry, is called the CAM 5.2. Again, I had to do some detective work to figure out where this name comes from. This name comes from one of the discoverers of this stain. Her name was Carol A. Mackin. Oh, okay. That's, that's how CAM comes from. 
Oh, okay. CAM 5.2. So CAM 5.2 is another great pan-keratin stain that you use in immunohistochemistry all the time. And it's a great complement to A1, A3. So generally I use, if I'm trying to prove something is a carcinoma or not a carcinoma, I try to use both keratin A1, A3 and CAM 5.2 before going to the more specific keratins like 720, you know, I use, try to use a broad spectrum keratin. Okay. Also cytoplasmic. Okay, where are we with the cytoplasmic markers? Here's kit, used to be called C kit, was very famous because it started the era of personalized therapy. Now it's just called kit and this is CD117. And CD117 stains both the cytoplasm and the membrane. The name kit also has an interesting history because it comes from kitten, literally like a kitten. Oh, wow. Okay. It was because kit was isolated from a pet cat with a, with a fibro, so-called fibrosarcoma. Okay. And so the person who named it, named it kit after kitten. <laughs> and now cute. we just use it all the time. I didn't know that, that it was even named after that. I had to do some detective work. So the most famous use of kit is for diagnosis of the, a tumor called GI stromal tumor or GIST. Right. But it's also uh, positive in many other things like melanoma and seminoma. So stains the cytoplasm and membrane. Okay, then we have another GIST marker, a marker for GI stromal tumors. That also has an interesting name. Interesting that C kit comes from a kitten and dog one comes from, you know, sounds like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, the, that would have been my guess. Is, what's that? Sorry. <laughs> that would have been my guess. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So kit and dog, you have to remember that Abhimanyu and you'll be done with your markers for GI stromal tumors. Okay. Cats and dogs, right? Right, right. Okay. <laughs> so this was, this marker was discovered on GIST. So it's called dog, D-O-G, dog okay. one. All right. This is also an example of a cytoplasmic marker. Then there, there's a um, relatively recent stain called fumarate hydratase, FH, which is mm -hmm. lost in fumarase, fumarate hydrodeficient carcinomas, like mm -hmm. some renal cell carcinomas. Um, just, just a second, Dr. Sanjay. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly go shut the door. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we are talking here about cytoplasmic markers. If you are joining us now in this... Uh, uh, immunohistochemistry talk, we are talking about cytoplasmic markers and we have gotten as far as fumarate hydratase. And uh, my discussant here is Abhimanyu Tushir from Canada and we are having a great time just chatting about immunohistochemistry. All right, Abhimanyu. So let's move to the next cytoplasmic marker, prostate specific antigen, PSA. We already talked about this, right? Right. We and we all already said that NKX 3.1 is rapidly becoming more pop popular uh, than this marker, PSA. That's this has been the gold standard. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, dear. What, what were you saying, Abhimanyu? Um, this is less sensitive. Correct. Right. Okay. But has more, you know, we have been using this for decades as the, you know, as our standard marker for prostate cancer. So everybody right. knows about PSA. It is a cytoplasmic marker. Then we have this marker that we use a lot for melanomas. It's called mm -hmm. HMB45, human melanoma black 45. That's where the name comes from. Oh, wow. Okay. Human melanoma black, HMB45. And it's also a great marker for a group of tumors called pecomas, perivascular epithelioid cell omas. Right. And pecomas, some of uh, the things that are called pecomas are LAM, lymphangiomyomatosis in the lung, angiomyolipomas in the kidney. These are tumors that arise in patients with tuberous sclerosis often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's another use of the HMB45 um, antibody. Cytoplasmic marker. You see that, Abhimanyu? The unstained nucleus? Yeah, the blue dots. And you see the red chromogen? Right, right. Right? So not all chromogens are, are brown, obviously. <laughs> right. right. Okay, let's go to another cytoplasmic stain, inhibin. This is a great marker for adrenocortical tumors and sex cord stromal tumors. So SF1 is the nuclear marker of these tumors, and inhibin is the cytoplasmic marker of these tumors. Okay. So you right. could use either one for, for these. And now let's move to the last part of the talk. Okay, Abhimanyu. So now we are going to membrane stains. Mm -hmm. Things that should stain the cell membrane. And they may or may not stain the cytoplasm, but they are, should not stain the nucleus. They, they are usually um, membrane stains because they are located on the surface of the cell membrane, you know, like uh, receptors and things like that. So the most famous one nowadays is programmed death ligand one, PDL1. If you, if you haven't heard about PDL1, 
as a pathologist, the ground will open up and you will get sucked into, into that and never heard from again. <laughs> I heard about it from one of your talks. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> you must you must know about PDL1 Abhimanyu because it's very, very important nowadays for therapy. And there's so many PDL1, PD1, PDL1 inhibitors. So you must know about that. So PDL1 is a is is a protein that is expressed on the surface of tumor cells, and that tumor cells use this to evade the immune system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so because it's on the surface, so the staining with PDL1 is membrane staining. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So that's the important thing to know. The, I could do like a two-hour lecture on PDL1 alone, but I'm going to spare you the torture of that. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to another membrane marker, which is called D240. And this is a marker that's positive in lymphatic things, lymphatic endothelium, you know, lymphatic um, uh, neoplasms, but also in mesotheliomas. So that's another use for th this marker. So lymphatic things and mesotheliomas, and this is a membrane stain. Mm -hmm. Another stain that we use in lung pathology is called MOC31, MOC31. This is a marker that is a non-mesothelial stain. So it stains uh, adenocarcinomas and other tumors, not mesothelioma. And the name comes from monoclonal antibody against oat cell carcinoma 31. Oat cell carcinoma is an old name for small cell. Right. right. So that's how it was discovered on small cell carcinomas and then became known as a general purpose carcinoma marker. So this is a membrane stain. Mark 31 is a membrane stain. Mm -hmm. which we commonly use for the differential of mesothelioma versus adenocarcinoma in the pleura. Okay. I use this a lot. Um, then all the CDs, Abhimanyu. So all the CDs, when you hear a CD this, CD that, mm -hmm. CD stands for cluster of differentiation. Right. And all those markers are located on the membrane, cell membrane. So every mm -hmm. CD marker, virtually every CD marker should be positive on the cell membrane too. So here you see CD45, which is the most famous broad spectrum lymphocyte marker. Stains all lymphocytes, whether T or B, and therefore stains all lymph most lymphomas, whether T or B cell lymphomas. There are only a few that are, that are CD45 negative. It stains both the cytoplasm and cell membrane. Similarly, CD20, we started this lecture with CD20, right? Is a cell membrane marker. It's right. a marker of B lymphocytes and mm -hmm. then B cell lymphomas, any B cell lymphoma. Similarly, CD3 is the reverse of that. It's a T cell marker. So right. It stains T lymphocytes and any malignancies that are of T lymphocyte origin. CD3 and CD20. Mm -hmm. Then we have CD68. This is not, now this is kind of an exception to my, it should be located on the membrane rule because CD68 is actually a cytoplasmic stain, not a membrane stain. So okay. right as I told you the rule, already we have a thing that breaks that rule. <laughs> so I, I guess it's not a rule then. So CD68 is a cytoplasmic marker for macrophages, things of macrophage origin. Okay. CD10 is a stain that is positive in the germinal center. So very similar to BCL6 that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. And this is a membrane marker. CD10 is used for germinal centers and for germinal center derived lymphomas. You'll see that a lot when you go to hematopathology. CD5 is like CD3. So a subset of CD3 positive cells are also positive for CD5. This is a T cell marker. Right. CD5 is also positive in a, one type of lymphoma, uh, one type of carcinoma, which is carcinomas that arise in the thymus. Thymic carcinomas are positive for CD5. Oh, okay. Then we have a CD that's positive in plasma cells and that's called CD138. And that's uh, both positive in normal plasma cells and malignant plasma cells, which is myeloma, plasma cell neoplasm. Mm -hmm. Then we have cytokeratin stains. Now, cytokeratin stains can be positive both in the cytoplasm and the cell membrane. One of the famous ones is CK7 that stains lung epithelium, for example, lung epithelium and lung carcinomas and many other things. The famous thing is above the diaphragm. All of these things are above the diaphragm. And similarly, there's a below the diaphragm stain called CK20. So in this mm -hmm. particular case, it's staining pancreatic adenocarcinomas. Mm -hmm. uh, CK20 is also famous for staining uh, colonic cancers. So the right. cytokeratin stains can be both cytoplasmic and membrane. So remember that in general. Okay. Then there's this, uh, another famous cytokeratin stain is cytokeratin 5.6, or today we would say keratin 5.6. <laughs> 
right? right? And this is a great marker for squamous cell carcinoma, not as sensitive as P63 or P P40, but, but pretty good. Mm -hmm. And it also stains normal squamous epithelium, also stains mesothelioma. So although P63, P40 don't stain mesothelioma, CK56 does stain mesotheliomas. Okay, but those are nuclear stains and this one is cytoplasmic. Correct, very good, yes. So P63 and P40 are nuclear stains and this one is cytoplasmic. So you've already learned a lot about, about nuclear and cytoplasmic and you are remembering it too, Abhimanyu. So that's a great sign, great sign that this is happening. So, okay, so we'll stop it here, Abhimanyu. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been great to chat with you. 